So welcome to the Demography Today uh, lecture series, uh, sponsored by the BBVA uh, Foundation in coordination with the Spanish National Research Council, the Lompoc Horizon 2020 project. And we have the pleasure today to have uh, here Elspeth uh, Graham. Elspeth has uh, recently retired from her role as a co-director of the uh, Economic and Social Research Council Center for Population Change where she jointly led the fertility and family research strand. And uh, she is now Professor Emeritus in, uh, in Geography at the University of St Andrews in UK. She holds a master's degree in Geography and Economics and a PhD in Social Science. Her research interests are in population and health and she has published uh, widely on issues related to low fertility in Europe, housing and demography, migration and geographies of health and left behind children in Southeast Asia, where uh, she's currently, currently working on projects in uh, Europe and Thailand and uh, in other places. Um, and it's a real pleasure that uh, we can have her here in Madrid, uh, just for our lecture series. As usual, we have uh, between 45 minutes to one hour talk. Uh, feel free just uh, uh, to control your time. And then we open the, the floor for questions. So welcome. Well, this evening I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about some ongoing work. Um, this is work that has been uh, part of my work portfolio for many years now, as you'll see. But what I'm interested in today is the longer term effects of parental migration on the psychological well-being of children who have been left behind in Indonesia and the Philippines. And Diego's just been saying that uh, even in Spain, Filipino uh, nannies, uh, child carers, uh, are quite uh, common amongst a certain um, part of society. And of course, many of them will have left their own children behind in the Philippines to do that work. And so what I'm interested in is not the migrants themselves, but the impact of having a migrant parent on the children who stay behind in the two study countries of Indonesia and the Philippines. The, The lecture uh, outline, just very briefly so that you know where we're going, I'll give you a, a brief introduction to labour migration, particularly in Southeast Asia, and some of the work that's previously been done on this, and then talk about the big project that I've been doing for a long time called the Champsy Project, and introduce the research questions that I want to look at today, in particular thinking about why I've chosen to focus on psychological well-being and how we measure that in children. Then I'm going to present something of the cross-sectional results that we've got. That is, we've measured this at two points in time. So if we look at each time point separately, what do we find? And then the fourth section will be presenting lagged models. So if we take all the data and look at it as a lagged model, do we find any significant effect? And that's what I'm calling the longer term effect. And then I'll just draw some concluding remarks. So let's start with labor migration in Southeast Asia. Um, as is very familiar, I'm sure to the audience here, international circuits of labor migration are a very significant feature of today's global economy. In fact, the global economy relies on labor migration, or many parts of it do. And in Southeast Asia, the number of international labor migrants has really increased markedly since the 1970s, and I'll show you some figures on that. But the two countries that I'm interested in today, the Philippines and Indonesia, these are major sending countries of the region. So they're the most important countries that export labor migrants in the region. But the majority of their labor migrants don't come to Europe. The majority of them go elsewhere, and they tend to work in fairly low-skilled or semi-skilled jobs in the wealthier countries of the region and slightly beyond. This means that many of them are on fixed-term contracts, two to three years, and they have no rights or pathways to citizenship 
or permanent residency in many of the countries that they go to. And that's very important because although they are on two to three year contracts, often they extend to another two to three year contract and another one and they never have any rights of pathways to citizenship or permanent residency in many of the countries they go to. But from the point of view of the household who stay behind, of course, labor migration has created this new form of family life, what we call the transnational family. That is a family whose close members are divided across national borders. And one of my major interests is in the transnational family. So let's look at Indonesia and the Philippines in a little more detail. The Philippines has been described as the prototype of a labor exporting nation. And we'll see why that's so when we look at some figures. But a major feature of the Philippines out migration, labor migration in the 21st century has been its feminization. In other words, the proportion of women who are leaving has tended to be high, although that's recently declined a little bit. So let's look at, at some figures. So we've got the Philippines first, 96 million population. Spain is 46 million, yeah. 33% um, of its population is under the age of 15. Take Spain as an example, 15% under the age of 15, so almost double. Um, but per capita, gross domestic product in US dollars, it's only two and a half thousand dollars or was this is a, a 2012 figure when we started the projects so um, equivalent for Spain something like 30,000 US dollars uh, out of a population of 96 million um, with a 33 percent uh, under 15 um, the Philippines nevertheless sends now over a million people per year overseas to work. So this is a really significant outflow of workers from the Philippines. And uh, at the beginning of this time period, before the global downturn, global crisis, 74% um, of these were female. That has decreased a little, but there's still a majority of female Filipinas going abroad. Indonesia, Look at its population. It's very much larger than the Philippines, uh, 248 million. Um, almost as many of its population or percentage of its population under 15 and a slightly higher per capita income, but still way below anything in Europe. Um, it sends about half a million uh, per year annual deployment and that's remained more or less steady. But again, in the early 2000s, 68% of these were female. By the later 2000s, uh, or 2010s, 56.8%, um, so 57%. So it, there's been a decline in the number of female migrants, but nevertheless, they still dominate. They're still the majority. Um, this picture, oh, sorry, this picture, by the way, is a special check-in or pre-check-in at Manila Airport, especially for overseas OFWs, overseas foreign workers. So there's a whole bureaucratic structure around exporting labor from the Philippines. What has been done on the families and particularly the children who stay behind when these labor migrants move abroad? Well, the early studies tended to be qualitative studies. They used qualitative data, they interviewed labor migrants themselves, um, often, uh, or older children, teenagers, young adults, um, and they often found negative consequences uh, for both the children who had been left behind and for the migrant mothers. There was very much a focus on migrant mothers. Although Perennis, who you see here, um, in the list of references, Perennis did actually identify quite an important thing in the Philippines, that is when 
the fathers came back, there was a problem because an emotional gap had opened up between the child, or now older child, and the father. So those were the early studies, negative consequences. More recent studies using larger data sets, many of them quantitative data sets, um, their results have been rather mixed. Uh, they've suggested a varied relationship uh, between parental migration and child well-being. Sometimes they find a positive influence, sometimes a negative influence, and sometimes even both, depending on what measure is being used. So child well-being is rather a, a general term, and depending on how you measure it, you often get a slightly different answer. But there are fairly large projects going on not just in Southeast Asia, but in South Asia, Latin America, and Africa, looking at children who are left behind or stay behind when their parent goes abroad to work. There have been very few comparative studies, ours is one of them, but uh, what these do suggest is that the country of origin is important. The household is important. How the care for the child is set up is important, and not necessarily parental migration per se. So there may be other things that arise because of parental absence that are important for the outcomes on children's well-being. My comments on these current studies, many are small scale, many are single location, and many are retrospective, and each of these presents limitations for the studies. There is a tendency to rely on cross-sectional surveys, unsurprisingly because there are very few appropriate surveys for, for studying left behind children. Um, and there is a lack of secondary data, longitudinal data. Now it's beginning to come on stream. There are some for Indonesia, for example, but they don't have all the details that you might want to study children's well-being. There's also a huge literature growing up on China, but I've left that aside because uh, that is theoretically internal migration, but of course, the, such a vast country and the setup there, it's very similar results to other places. So the longer term implications of parental migration for children left behind remain unclear simply because most studies have not been able to take a longitudinal perspective. CHAMPSI, the, day, the uh, project that I'm going to introduce in a second, we have a whole lot of measures of child well-being. So we have physical health measures, we have psychological well-being, and I'll describe how we measured that, we have subjective well-being, um, educational achievement, all sorts of aspects of the child that we might want to uh, interrogate to see whether the child is better or worse off with the parent, parent absent. So we also have detailed data on parental migration and the characteristics of the household and the child's principal caregiver because caregiving becomes very important when a parent is absent. We have two waves of data. Um, we think this is quite an achievement, but obviously there are also limitations if you only have two waves of data. So this is our project, uh, CHAMPSI, because it's the Child Health and Migrant Parents in Southeast Asia project. Um, and this is its logo. Uh, and these are some of our, this is me um, uh, actually training some of our interviewers in the Philippines. And this is our, our interviewers in Indonesia, two of them. They had to carry weighing scales, they had to carry height measures, and so on. So um, it was quite a, a, an effort for them. So Champsy wave one. It was a mixed method study from the beginning. It was designed as such, and it was also designed to compare children in these transnational households with one or both parent absent, uh, working overseas, with households where both parents were present. So there was, a, if you like, a control group, or what we call a comparison group. We surveyed around about 1,000 households in four countries, and that was in 2008. And then the following year, we did qualitative interviews with a subsample of the households, the 
uh, what we call the responsible adult in the household, the caregiver of the child, and the older children themselves, not the younger children. Um, <coughs> we had a, a sample. We could not take a nationally representative sample. There was no way we could do that. So we had a very strict protocol for our sample. Um, and again, theoretically, it would be possible to repeat it. Um, but the sample of 1,000 was a flexible quota sample. We identified the provinces within each country with high out, highest out-migration rates, and then the communities within those provinces, and then the families within those communities that qualified for our study. Importantly, we only selected intact families. That means we have no single parents in our initial uh, wave one survey. The parents also had to be, or the migrant parent or parents, had to be away for at least six months. And we, we set that partly because other studies had said six months, but partly because we thought that was the minimum time where you might see an impact on the child. And we selected only one child, what we call the index child, from each household. So that was the, the, the sample. We actually looked at two age groups of children. What I'm calling the younger children were preschool, uh, three to five years old, um, when we first went into the field in 2008. And we also interviewed and surveyed primary school children aged nine, 10, and 11. We did this in non-metropolitan high out-migration communities in these four study countries. But today I'm just going to be talking about the younger group, the, the group that was preschool in 2008, and the two countries, Indonesia and the Philippines. So then we did a second wave of data collection where we looked, traced all the families or tried to trace all the families that had been in wave one and we went into the field in 2016, eight years later. We resurveyed as many families as we could find, and then the following year, we did exactly the same. We took a subsample of those families and we interviewed that subsample. So, preschool children in 2008 were in middle childhood, ages 11 to 13, by the time we caught up with them. Uh, eight years later at wave two. We were extremely fortunate in Indonesia. We have an attrition rate of 6.9%, which I think is quite an achievement, but not so fortunate in the Philippines. So in the Philippines, our attrition rate is 26.8%. These percentages are both just for the younger child. Actually, our overall percentages are very low in the Indonesia, but a little bit lower than this, curiously, in the uh, Philippines. What we had to do then, of course, before we could analyze the data, is begin to see who was missing and what the attrition was in the Philippines. And you'll see I just took one example here, which is the wealth index. So as far as the wealth of the households that are missing um, are concerned, is concerned, you can see that the, the green line is the, the ones that are missing from the wave two data. And the top line there is the original data wealth distribution. And you can see there's not a huge difference. It's not a statistically significant difference. And we tested this on a number of things. So we know a lot about the families that are missing because we have all the wave one data. So we don't think that attrition, despite the fact that it's quite large, is a problem initially, but as you'll see, it is a problem when we come to analyzing some of the data. We can see why the Philippines has a higher attrition rate than Indonesia if we look at the pattern of migration. Now, these are the destinations of the parents that we surveyed in wave one in 2008. And I think you can see that here's the Philippines here in the dark red, red color. 
you can see that the major, these arrows, the width of them is proportional to the population moving to the migration stream. So you can see that the Middle East is the biggest destination for our sample and the same from Indonesia. The Middle East is a major destination. The second destination, and this is also quite important, from Indonesia is Malaysia. So these are the two big destinations. But look at this arrow. This is your Filipino maids coming to Spain and elsewhere. Hardly any Indonesians go to Europe. Um, at this, by this time, there was hardly anybody going to North America, although prior to this, that was quite a, a major part of Filipino uh, migration. So that's wave one. Here's wave two. So by eight years later, where were the parents of these children going? I think you can see that you've still got a major flow to the Middle East from the Philippines, but that's really cut back with Indonesia, and there's a reason for that. Um, but what I want to point out is you've still got this flow to Europe that's larger. And that's what's happened to some of these families. They've disappeared because Europe allows family reunification, whereas the Middle Eastern countries do not. Nor does Taiwan, which is also a, a, a major, or Singapore, other uh, local destinations. So that's why we lose more from the Philippines than we do from Indonesia. In the Philippines, there's long been popular worries. The popular press catches on to this every now and again and says, oh, if all these women leave, there's going to be a crisis of care for our children in the Philippines. And this worry about parental absence, although it tends to focus on mothers with the care deficit, also focuses on fathers' absence by saying these children who are growing up without the discipline of a father present in the household will become delinquent. Their, their, their conduct will be uh, a problem. And this question, what kind of adults will result from children who will be growing up without fathers, mothers, or both, is, has circulated in the Philippines for quite some time. And an early study by the Scalabrini Migration Center, who are one of our collaborators, um, called Hearts Apart, this is 2004, um, this points out, in the realm of public opinion, the verdict is largely negative. Many stories, rumours and speculations circulate about philandering husbands or wives, spendthrift children and children becoming wayward. So the popular idea is that there may be a problem here. But the evidence has been lacking um, and there have been very few studies that have actually looked in detail about whether children are having problems or whether they indeed they benefit from all the remittances that the parents send back. So whether children benefit or suffer when their parent goes abroad to work, um, we need more evidence. And we also need evidence to see whether when the mother migrates, that is worse for the child or not, because that's the popular idea. Why did we decide to focus on psychological well-being? Well, I've just mentioned that one of the ideas that's circulating in the popular um, press is that these children will grow up to be juvenile delinquents. They will, their conduct will become a problem. They've got too much money in relation to their peers whose parents have not gone abroad to work because their parents send remittances back. Um, and so the whole idea that the psychology, mental health, if you like, of these children might suffer interested us. And we did find quite a lot of evidence in the first wave of the Champsy qualitative interviews that some of the children were very upset when their mothers or fathers went away. And this is just one quote from a 10-year-old Filipino boy. And he says, mummy contacts us through the cell phone. Sometimes she texts, sometimes she calls, just once in a while. 
I feel sad when she calls. I want her to go home. I tell her to be careful. Now that's something that we found echoed in a number of interviews where the parent was in the Middle East. I want her to be careful. Uh, that seemed to be a particular problem. However, to study this uh, topic of the psychological well-being or mental health of children, there really is quite a lack of accepted cross-cultural measures, and we were wanting to look at two very different cultures, Indonesia, a Muslim country, um, and the Philippines, I mean, the Catholic country. But one instrument that has been validated in a number of countries throughout the world is the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, or SDQ. And this is the measure that we decided to use. And there are a growing number of studies now in Bangladesh, for example, in Pakistan and Sri Lanka that have used this uh, Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire to investigate the mental health of young children. The questionnaire itself was developed by Robert Goodman, a UK psychologist, based psychologist, um, as a screening tool for child mental disorders. And as a screening tool, it has 25 items, but we are going to focus today on just two subscales. Five item subscales with scores ranging from zero to 10. And the reason for this, you'll see the subscales here, the reason for this is the evidence we have that children actually suffer emotionally, which is an internalizing mental health problem, and their conduct suffers, or might suffer, um, which is an externalizing behavioral problem. So we wanted to look at both these aspects of psychological well-being, and to do that, we used these two subscales, five item subscales. We took these cutoff points. So if a score is over four for um, emotional symptoms or over three for conduct problems, this is Robert Goodman's uh, suggestion for the UK, um, then these predict cases of mental disorder. And we use, an, in the analyses, we use a dichotomous measure. So we're, we're quite cautious. We put normal and borderline cases together and say these are not cases of mental disorder. And uh, we put the um, abnormal, cases in the abnormal range and say the child has conduct problems or emotional distress. So those are the measures that we use. And here are the questions that we wanted to answer. So, First of all, do children living in transnational households have poorer psychological well-being on these two measures compared to children living with both parents? So this comparison group um, was very important. And as a sub-question to that, is it really true that children of migrant mothers are especially disadvantaged? Is there something about not having a mother there that especially disadvantages and in this case, young children. And the real crucial question, which we are struggling to answer at the moment, is does parental migration in early childhood, that's at three, four, and five, does it actually influence children's psychological well-being in the longer term? And we use the two waves of the Chumpsy data to try and answer that question. Is there a longer term effect? So first of all, just very briefly, the cross-sectional results. Now, we, ha we did actually publish a paper quite early on in the Journal of Marriage and Family, and this is based in, uh, published in 2011, and this is based on the Wave 1 data only, obviously, because we hadn't done the Wave 2 data collection. But this includes all our children, that is, the two age cohorts. So what I'm about to show you is just taking out the younger age cohort and focusing on our two study countries, whereas we used all our countries in that cross-sectional analysis. So here are the uh, models. Um, and I'm just going to summarize the main variables in these models. And this is our main variable. Now, what we found, of course, is that the caring or caregiving arrangements for the child, what we call household arrangements, 
were important for, for example, physical health. And so we thought they might be important for all our child outcomes, but they correlated very much with the migration status of the parents. So if the father had migrated, the mother usually cared for the children, as you might imagine. But if the mother migrated, the father often cared for the children. And if both parents migrated, then the grandmother or perhaps an aunt cared for the child or children. So we've got this, what we call migration carer status with four categories, I'll show you in a minute. We have the age of the child in the model, the gender of the child, the birth order of the child, whether they're a first, second or third child, whether they have a long-term disability because that might affect their psychological well-being and not the migration of the parents, the education of the caregiver, the caregiver's own mental health, quite important, uh, household wealth, and whether the child, the index child, has younger siblings. So these are the main uh, items in the models. And these are our household arrangements. Um, we have the child who lives with both parents as the comparison group. We have the transnational households, and they are divided into father migrant with mother caring for the child, mother migrant with father caring for the child, or, and this is a, a slightly mixed group, but the, both parents or one parent migrant, but the other, uh, or sorry, but an other caring for the child. So usually a relative. We don't actually have anybody, I think, in our sample that was paid to care for the child. It was usually the grandmother or often the aunt. So these are our, our groups for the analysis. Here's the data set for the younger child. So you can see that uh, what we've done for this analysis, uh, oops, just to show you, is we've actually worked backwards. So we have 463 cases where we have wave two data, and we've just taken those cases and looked at their situation at wave one. So we don't include every young child that we surveyed at wave one. And we've only got 358 cases for the Philippines because we have that rather larger uh, attrition. Here's where we have a problem. We'll come to that. But we have got small numbers in that particular category. What's the prevalence of abnormal scores amongst these children? Well, if you look, the yellow bars are the emotional symptoms. These are abnormal scores. That means that these children are likely to be suffering from emotional distress. Um, and the green bars are the conduct problems, which means these children are said by their caregivers to have conduct problems on this uh, measure, set of measures. And you can see that um, in the Indonesia, the both emotional symptoms and conduct problems, 30%, over 40% with abnormal scores. So quite a high percentage of these young children had problems. By the time they're 11 to 13, the number of abnormal scores has dropped considerably, but you still have 20% roughly of these children with mental health issues, according to this measure. In the Philippines, Quite, quite similar in terms of conduct, over 40% of the children, young children had abnormal scores for conduct and uh, <coughs> a, a smaller percentage, about 21% had abnormal scores on emotional symptoms. Also fallen considerably and considerably lower than for Indonesia. So we have a, a, a real difference between the two countries. So here's some results. This is wave one, and these are the measures for emotional distress. So these are predicting emotional distress, and I'm only showing you the uh, key variable, that is the transnational or the household arrangements, non-migrants versus the transnational households. The solid bars are significant statistically. The uh, other bars are not. So this is not significant, this is not significant, these are not significant. 
So what you can see is that compared to the non-migrant households, children in non-migrant households, children in households where the father is the migrant and the mother is the caregiver are more likely to suffer from emotional distress. It's also the case in Indonesia when the mother is away and the father is the caregiver. But note, this is two times and this is nearly three times. So actually it looks as if you have more emotional distress amongst the children if their father is away than if their mother is away. What about conduct problems? Very different picture. Again, the uh, bars are, uh, are significant um, if they're solid, and you can see that nothing is significant in Indonesia. But we have significance in conduct in the Philippines. Again, uh, it's significant if the father is away and the mother is caring for the child, or if the parents are migrant and the, some other person is caring for the child. But note, these children are better off. They're less likely to have conduct problems than their peers who are living in non-migrant households. So we actually find two very different things on two different measures. We find an advantage for some children in the Philippines and a disadvantage on emotional symptoms for some children in Indonesia. So here we have evidence of poorer, this is just a summary, poorer emotional uh, well-being amongst preschool children of migrant parents in Indonesia compared with their peers living in non-migrant households. The father migrant, a mother carer, the children in those households nearly three times as likely to have emotional distress. Um, and if the mother's migrant, the father's carer, nearly twice as likely. So this is to the detriment of the children. But nothing in the Philippines is statistically significant. Oh. Sorry. Conduct problems. Philippines, we can see the conduct is better. Some evidence for better uh, psychological well-being amongst those with migrant parents. Children of migrant fathers, mother carers, less likely to have conduct problems. That's actually quite significant or important because that is the mother assessing the conduct problems. We were worried that when the father access, uh, assesses the conduct problems, he might not be as uh, likely to report conduct problems. But this is the mother. Um, but also other carers. So when the child is left with what is in the literature known as other mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and so on, also less likely to have conduct problems. But no association found in Indonesia. So that's our, our wave one results. Now if we go to wave two and we simply look at those cross-sectionally, what do we find? Nothing. No significant results at all. So if we had come into the field and we had surveyed this set of children when they were um, 11, 12, we would have found no significant results for Indonesia or for the Philippines. So that's the cross-sectional wave two. No evidence in wave two of any significant association between parental migration and psychological well-being, either emotional distress or conduct disorders. So in middle childhood, there does not seem to be any relationship between psychological well-being and household arrangements. But that still left us with a question. What we know is that many of the children have experienced changes in their living arrangements between time one and time two, between wave one and wave two. We know a third of Indonesian children, for example, and nearly a quarter of the Filipino children <laughs> that we resurveyed experienced a change in the migration status of their children, or of their parents between waves one and two. And 
we obviously need a more longitudinal perspective to actually capture these changes. So, this is one of the sites, by the way, that we were <laughs> was flooded. We, we had a lot of uh, local problems, shall we say, with um, the weather. Uh, so, does parental migration in early childhood influence children's psychological well-being in middle childhood? And we decided to look at this first by using a simple lagged model. So, we've got exactly the same set of variables as before. We're controlling for what happens at time two only in relation to this one thing which we know changes over time between the two time periods, and that is the household arrangements, the migration carer status of the household. And then we want to see whether this set of variables will actually predict any longer term effect in terms of emotional distress and conduct problems. So here's what we find. We find a significant result for Indonesia when the father is away and the mother stays at home to look after the children. And we find that these children are about three times, over three times, as likely to suffer from uh, emotional disorders eight years later than are the children who lived when they were young in non-migrant households. So that's really, if you've got a, a, a father away and your mother caring for you when you're two or three, four or five years old, then eight years later, you're more likely to suffer from emotional problems if your father's away. Nothing else is, is significant statistically. What about conduct problems? Well, again, it's Indonesia this time that shows up in terms of conduct problems. And these are children who have been left with a non-parental carer with their grandmother or an aunt when they were very young, three, four, and five. And in the longer term, they suffer from abnormal scores on the conduct problems index. So they're more likely to have conduct problems, statistically more likely than the, their peers living in, who lived in non-migrant households when they were young. So this is time one variables predicting the outcome eight years later. So that's our evidence for thinking that there's a longer term effect here. <coughs> Indonesia, time one, all these uh, uh, predictions or uh, predictor variables, um, we find both internalizing and externalizing psychological disorders are predicted by the migration status of the parents when the child was young. So children whose fathers were migrant, mothers caring, at ages three, four, and five, three times, over three times as likely to suffer from emotional distress eight years later compared with those who lived with both parents. And children of these other mothers, when they were young, over twice as likely. Again, in Indonesia, and no evidence of any longer term effect in the Philippines. However, I pointed out these small numbers. We cannot say really because of very small numbers of mothers who are away when the child is very, very young, three, four, and five. Um, so subsequent studies may find uh, uh, something significant in the Philippines, but we haven't. So we have no evidence at the moment. <clears throat> but we do find that in Indonesia, it's the children of migrant fathers, and those are left with other caregivers who have poorer psychological well-being. It's not the children of migrant mothers, as far as we can see. Um, this could reflect some things that have been found in other studies. For example, that mothers struggle to cope uh, when uh, the father is away, particularly perhaps in some traditional uh, societies. Um, and there's also been a, a little bit of mostly qualitative literature on attachment. If a child is left at a very young age, uh, they tend to become attached to whoever they've 
lived with, if the mother comes back 10 years later to reclaim the child, as often happens, then there may be a problem of attachment with that other. So the, the, you can see these are plausible findings. I'm not saying we've got the explanation yet. However, <coughs> let's see what our, our research question answers then. Our provisional answers are, if we look at whether children living in transnational households have poorer psychological well-being <coughs> compared to children living with both parents, the answer is yes for Indonesia at the preschool ages, but it depends on which parent is migrant and who's caring for the child. So it's not just a simple yes. Some preschool children living in transnational households in the Philippines actually have better, apparently, psychological well-being at a young age. No association in middle childhood if we simply look cross-sectionally. <clears throat> we don't find any supporting evidence that mother, uh, children of mother migrants are particularly disadvantaged, as the popular press suggests. But if we ask about the longer-term effects, the only ones we find are for Indonesia, but we do find some, and we were uh, surprised, I suppose, that they were as strong as they are, but not for the Philippines. However, ever ambitious, we've still got other things to do with this uh, data sets. Um, we need to recognize that these children have changes in their experience of, of parental migration. And some families change the migrant quite frequently. So um, the mother might go away for a little while, then the father away and so on, then both away. Um, and we collected detailed migration histories uh, for each of the children. So we have migration histories from their birth right through for the older children until they're 1920. Um, so we have this big trajectory of migration histories. And what we want to do is do a sequence analysis for the samples that we have to try and generate clusters of similar migration experience for the children and then use these in the analysis rather than our cross-sectional categories. And I'll just finish with a, a, an illustration of this. We've been doing sequence analysis for our older group. Um, so this is not the group that we've been talking about uh, today, but this is uh, Lani, a young Indonesian woman. She's aged 19. We interviewed her eight years ago um, when she was 11. And you can see, here's our wave one data collection, here's our wave two data collection. Now, before that, uh, her parents, by the way, were usually resident. That means they were non-migrant at the time of our first survey, but both parents had been away for quite a lot of her young life. Um, sometimes the father was away on his own, sometimes he came back, then the mother was away, then they were both away. I mean, this is quite a, a lot of change in a young life. A wave one, this child would have been classified cross-sectionally as non-living with both parents in a non-migrant household. Subsequently, again, you've got mother away, um, both parents away, mother back. Uh, but by the time wave two, when she was 19, her parents had both come back and they'd been back for um, the, each of these small bars is a month, so they'd been back for six months. So this is a case where the child has a very diverse experience of migration of her parents, but the parents, according to our cross-sectional analysis, are part of that usually resident. So what we are now able to do is have a, what we call a clean uh, comparison group, we have a comparison group where we know the parents have never been away before and our clusters of migration experience to try and analyze the longitudinal effects of, uh, or the longer term effects of parental migration and whether the pattern as well as the fact of being away matters. So just some concluding remarks. I think from what I've said, you can see that one of the major lessons from this work 
has been the problem with cross-sectional analysis. As I say, if we'd done the analysis at the, uh, in 2016 for the first time, we would have found no uh, cross-sectional impact of parental migration on child psychological well-being. But we did find it for younger children, and we do find some evidence of a longer-term effect. So, some evidence of a longer-term effect means that under certain circumstances, this is bad for child well-being. It seems that even in the Philippines, the uh, advantage experienced by some younger children with migrant parents disappears. So, although there doesn't seem to be a disadvantage emerging, nevertheless, the advantage disappears. But we also find some commonalities between the two countries. And one thing that strikes us in all the analysis we've done is that the mental health of the person caring for the child is extremely influential. And we need to look into that a little bit more. But that's in Indonesia, that's also in the Philippines. So the mental health of the caregiver is a risk factor for the child's mental health. And the challenge really is to try and explain some of these findings. Um, we're looking at migrant destinations. As I say, we have a detailed history, but migrant destinations have become important because we now have some parents who are actually uh, migrating within for the Philippines, within Indonesia. Um, and does that matter? We're looking into that. How often they contact the child. Um, we found that the group at uh, Wave 1 data collection least likely to contact their children was mothers, migrant mothers of Indonesian children who were working, migrant mothers working in the Middle East. And there was a good reason for that at the time because these women have the least opportunity to contact their families back home. There's also the idea of gendered expectations and this is really uh, a, a multifaceted and something that we're looking at using the um, qualitative data. But there are clear gendered expectations in all sorts of directions. So, for example, the women who are left behind, the mothers who are left behind in Indonesia, often find it difficult to, to, to make decisions simply because that's not normally their role. So there's, there's a... a, a, a a gendered expectation that a woman will be reliant on a man, and that often uh, could be one of the reasons for some of the problems experienced by Indonesian children looked after by their mother with their father away. But there's also another aspect of that, and that's the fathers. So the fathers um, tend to think of themselves as the disciplinarians in the family. And we have some evidence, but it's very preliminary at the moment, that when they come back, that creates problems. Because father comes back after eight years away or something and starts trying to discipline the children again. The children have grown up a bit, not used to him being there, and that can lead to tensions. So there's a whole lot of gendered questions. Um, and just finish with this, we need culturally contextualized understandings. Indonesia is obviously very different from the Philippines um, in many cultural aspects, not least religion, but in many cultural aspects. And uh, I think there are different gender relations there culturally um, that are part of this wider understanding. So that is what we're needing. So that we're trying to contribute uh, to this using the qualitative data. Um, and I have to acknowledge uh, a few people before we leave. Um, the Champsy Project has received funding from the Wellcome Trust in the UK, but also from the Ministry of Education that runs the Research Council grants in Singapore and the Research Grants Council in Hong Kong. Both Singapore and Hong Kong are receiving countries that take in migrants but do not give them the rights of residence. So they were interested to see what uh, the effect of this might be. Um, the analysis that, or some of the analysis that I've shown you of the longer term effects, 
Um, oops, I uh, am collaborating with Dr. Lucy Jordan in Hong Kong and Dr. Fang Lu in the National University of Singapore, and they're very much uh, involved in that. Um, and of course, I just need to recognize the very hard work of lots of people who made these possible. Um, we collaborate with the Center for Population and Policy Studies at Gajah Mada University in uh, Jogjakarta in Indonesia and with the Scalabrini Migration Center in the Philippines. And of course, with nearly a thousand uh, participating families in each country. So I'll leave you with um, a thank you. And this is our original team um, for Champsy. Thank you.